welcome everyone to the fourth lecture of our Tilden Arts online series. I'm Kathy McCarran, the Dean of Arts and Humanities here at Four Seas. I'm so excited to be here today and I wanna thank you very much for sharing your afternoon with us. We are thrilled to offer 10 events in the series ranging from today's compelling lecture to hands-on workshops in drawing and collage. Tilden Arts Online also includes three other series that you may be interested in. The first is the Higgins Art Gallery Virtual Exhibits and Panel Discussion. Our next one takes place on Thursday, April 20th and is titled Inhabiting the Land, Ecology, Gentle Architecture and Off the Grid Living. This is a group exhibit featuring Mark Adams, artist, cartographer and naturalist, Doug Ritter, artist and professor here at Four Seas and Malcolm Wells, an architect. And the registration is now open. The second series is our Bigger Boat Visiting Writers Series. And we actually have an event tonight at 6.30 if you want to double dip. And we have an amazing poet named Paul Guest and an equally amazing student musician and composer named Morgan Peters II. And three weeks from tomorrow on April 22nd at 2 p.m., we welcome international internationally acclaimed poet Martine Espada to Four Seas. And our final series is the weekly foreign film series, which takes place every Tuesday at 4 p.m. You can read all about these events by visiting our brand new Tilden Arts online website. Just visit capecod.edu slash Tilden online, or you can always send me an email. We are looking forward to finishing out the spring with a series of fun, provocative, and uplifting events. And it now gives me great pleasure to introduce this afternoon's presenter, Colin McPherson. Born in Scotland, Colin is an artist, photographer, and writer based in Liverpool, England. His career in photography developed in photojournalism before he moved on to undertaking long-term projects and initiatives alongside his work in the media. He is a member of Document Scotland and Six by Six Photography Collectives, and his work has been published and exhibited worldwide, including major exhibitions at the Scottish National Portrait Gallery in Edinburgh and the Martin Parr Foundation in Bristol. His work is held by a number of important photography collections and archives. He photographs and writes for a number of publications about soccer and is currently working on a book about the sport and the COVID-19 pandemic. Colin also self-publishes photo books and his latest entitled 100 Days of Solitude was released just this week. Colin will speak for about 35 to 40 minutes and then he will take questions. And just so you know, Colin is broadcasting live from Liverpool where it is 9 p.m. So when we get to the chat uh, at the end, if you can just type in the chat to me, Kathy McCarran, and I will field your questions. So Colin, welcome and turn it over to you. Um, good afternoon and good evening. Um, many thanks, first of all, to Kathy for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm really delighted to have the opportunity to talk a little bit about this work, uh, which I do quite often, but every time I talk about it, something new pops up, something um, inspires me to think about something, a new aspect of the work, which is fantastic. Um, I'd also like to thank my long-standing friend and colleague, Scott Anderson, um, who's a professor at Cape Cod, uh, Cape Cod College who, who suggested to Cathy that I might be interested in doing this and um, so I'm very grateful to both of you for allowing me this opportunity. Um, now that you've seen the whites in my eyes I think I'm going to move on to, to my presentation. I'm going to share my screen now. This is always the moment where it's, you need a little bit of a kind of hit and hope and a little bit of a prayer but hopefully if I do this, we should start to see um, some graphics and visuals. Lovely. There we are. Super. So Catching the Tide is the name for a long-term project, um, which I started in the mid-1990s, and I really stumbled across it by accident. And I want to talk a little bit about the genesis of the of the the project, but also look at some of the wider um, elements that uh, sprung up from the project, uh, including my photography and, and if you like, my curiosity about the world, which has been often been led by the nose, led by my photography, 
and used that as my way into various situations. Um, Catching the Tide is, is also the title of a film that was made about the work uh, in 2005. And I know if you search on, on YouTube, you will find that. If not, then on my Vimeo channel. Um, so picturing Scotland's last salmon net fisherman, how a visual exhibition through photography um, of a traditional rural industry became the catalyst for questions about community, the environment and politics and power in contemporary Scottish life. It's quite a lot to get through in 35 minutes and I suspect um, if you have questions we might broaden the, um, the whole discussion out at the end. Uh, I'm not going to read, I've not prepared this as a lecture, I'd, I, I'd prefer to kind of freestyle if you like and um, give you a few insights into one or two of the photographs but also then use those photographs as little touchstones for wider questions about the work and the project. So, let me see, I've got a clicking noise here. There we go. The first photograph I'd like to show you is um, taken two or three years into the project. And this is a, a group of men, salmon net fishermen. Now, the, the thing about we should know immediately about salmon net fishing in Scotland is that it, it no longer takes place. There's been a moratorium um, on catching wild Atlantic salmon using interceptory nets on beaches and in rivers for the last four or five years. That's something that the Scottish government introduced really to, in response to the sharp decline in salmon net and salmon returning to breeding rivers from, uh, from the breeding fields um, in the seas off Greenland. There's been a, a kind of slow and steady decline in numbers of fish over the years. And the reasons for that are controversial, shall we say. They're contested. Um, there's no one single reason, but uh, in many ways, the salmon net fishermen, whose heritage goes back many hundreds of years, uh, have found themselves on the wrong side of history. I think as so many traditional workers in small scale industries uh, and other aspects of fishing and agriculture, have also found themselves on the wrong side of history. What I loved about photographing this particular project was that I made friends, I made a lot of friends. Um, and I found that the men who I photographed, and it was exclusively men, um, I didn't find any women working in the industry actually doing the fishing, although I know that one or two did exist down the years. Um, for me, the way into this was really about friendship. It was about kinship. It was about understanding the bond that the men had, not only with each other, but also with the work itself. And in, a, in an odd sort of way, I suppose, the bond they had with the salmon, with the fish. And it was, it was a cultural thing for me. I was examining a culture and something that um, I repeatedly went back to over a number of years. I started in 1995. I kind of ended the project um, around 2007, 2008, when it became clear that the, the number of men fishing was declining to such an extent that I'd simply photographed them so often. So all the pictures I'm gonna show you um, this evening come from the east coast of Scotland. And for those of you not familiar with the geography of that part of the world, we're talking about an area between two of Scotland's major east coast cities. Dundee and further north Aberdeen. The, um, the men pictured here are fishing at a station called Bodden Point and the net that's behind them, which they've just finished constructing is what would be known as a fly net. It's one of several different types of net that was used to catch the salmon in the summer seasons. When I first stumbled across salmon net fishing, it was something that, although I'd grown up in Scotland, uh, spent my formative years as a photographer, traveling the country, working on various stories, I'd never actually come across it um, as a practice. And I happened to be walking along a beach one day at, uh, at a point fairly close to the, where this photograph was taken. And my friend and I were discussing the beautiful day it was, the wide open expanse of beach, and I pointed to these odd structures on the beach, long lines of ropes and nets all secured into the sand. 
And I asked my friend what that was, and she being sort of local said, well, it's, it's the salmon nets. Um, she didn't know much about it, which was interesting. And when I started then doing a bit of research into them, I found that actually it was a bit of an invisible industry. That although salmon net fishing existed in almost all small communities right across Scotland at one point, the history had not really been told. The heritage was being forgotten and the culture was being lost. So this for me, as an inquisitive photojournalist, provoked a real curiosity. And as I was working for a newspaper at the time, The Independent, I decided really to um, attack the, the, the story really as, as a piece of journalism. And I found a few salient facts very quickly, which was that the, the practice was in sharp decline and, and that basically I was, I was about to photograph something which would disappear. I wanted also to talk a little bit about the, the history and heritage of, of, of the actual salmon netting and um, my approach to it as a photographer. Because although I initially approached it as a piece of photojournalism, um, for me, it had a wider significance. And I had been looking around, I think, for something to photograph consistently. Because when you work in photojournalism, you tend to work from one story to the next. You almost work day to day. But this, when I discovered it, I felt had something of um, an opportunity to, to really drill deeply into a subject and a subject that wasn't well known. And I came across the work of this uh, man, Werner Kissling, who was a retired German diplomat who had actually moved to Scotland in the 1930s to escape uh, the Nazis. He'd been a diplomat in the German government and he'd been so appalled by what a was happening in Germany in the 1930s that he came to Scotland. He then, he was a keen photographer and he embarked then on um, travels around Scotland. And he had a very unique approach to his photography. He really documented things in a very painstaking, very methodical um, way of doing things. Things that, a way of doing things that you would really almost say he was cataloging items. There wasn't too much artistic impression or interpretation about his work. It was very straightforward, but it was very thorough. And he, he was the one who really documented to the greatest extent, many of the different types of net and practices and customs, many of which, as I said, had been handed down from generation to generation. His principal work was on the Solway, which is the Firth that uh, divides England and Scotland in the Southwest of the country. And I just loved these photographs. They were so evocative, so simple, and yet they had something very descriptive and powerful about them. <clears throat> I also was interested in Kisling's life. And for me, photography isn't just about picking up a camera. It's also about having a mission, about enveloping yourself in your work and thinking about not only what you can give to photography, but what photography can give to you. It offers you the opportunity tr to travel, to meet people, to really find out in a, in a very, in a very um, methodical and interested way, the world around us. So kind of using Werner Kisling as a template, I then went back from 1996 onwards, 96, 97 onwards, and really started to build up these relationships, many of which would last and endure for many years. Some of the netsmen I, I still know, I'm very proud to say I still know. My role really was as an observer and it always has been as a photographer. It's somebody who does stand on the sidelines but is engaged. And we talk a lot these days about socially engaged photography as a practice, but to me, documentary photography, good documentary photography relies on that engagement. The engagement the photographer has with the subject and I think it would be, it wouldn't be understating things to say that I almost became a salmon net fisherman. Although I have to say, I've never ever fished or killed a salmon, but I've eaten a few. What I loved most about photographing them was the, the sense of purpose, the sense of mission, but also the fact that they, everything had to be done in, <clears throat> with respect to the time and the tide and the seasons. So these pictures come from early season, around April time, 
when the, the nets would be reconstructed. So poles would be erected, the ropes strung up and affixed into the ground. And then these vast, vast nets all unfurled, untangled, and then um, put up um, on, the, on the net, on the structure. It was, it was painstaking work, it was backbreaking work, it was hard work. And there was salt, there was jellyfish, there was seaweed, there was cold. And that was before you'd even put a net up to catch a single salmon. So constructing a net like this would probably take two to three days, according to the, the tide and the weather. Often if the weather caught you, early season, spring in Scotland, it can be fairly wild. Sometimes the, the men would spend an entire day trying to erect the poles and put the nets up only to find a storm had crashed through and all their endeavours were for nothing and they'd have to start again. I was living in Edinburgh at the time, which is about 90 miles south of where these photographs were taken. So I would just uh, get in my car and go up and turn up and be welcomed. Um, not, not as a stranger, not as somebody who was just simply passing by, but somebody who had an interest. And I think my commitment to the subject and commitment to the men paid off very quickly because I think I earned their trust. Um, they helped me out as well on occasions because when the un one, one occasion when the tide came in, in at such great speed that I got marooned on a small sandbank, one of the big strong men gave me and all my cameras a piggyback to safety. I have to say that was one of the most inglorious moments of my career, but I did appreciate not having to swim for safety with my cameras. There was a lovely sense of camaraderie about the men. They would talk to each other and the, the accents they had, the accents in the, in the east, the northeast of Scotland were very particular, very strong. But you could tell they had a symbiotic relationship with each other, that each man knew what they were doing when they were constructing the nets. The jokes, the in-jokes, the rib take, the rib, um, the, um, the, the poking fun of each, each other, um, the taking the mickey, as we call it maybe here, was something that I as an outsider had to get used to, almost had to get my ear used to hearing what they were saying, as well as my eye used to being, getting used to what they were doing. So as a photographer, this was a luxury. I had the luxury of time. I could spend a lot of time on this project. And that commitment and the time that you spend on a long-term project usually pays dividends. My great influences early in my career have been people like Robert Frank, even the greats like Cartier-Bresson. I love black and white. I find it very expressive. I certainly printed all my, my own work and I always thought there was a sort of three-stage process where I would think what I was going to photograph. And in the, in, in the act of thinking, the taking, the mechanical taking of the photograph also fed in with the way I knew I was going to print it in the dark room. So each picture had this sort of three stage approach. And I loved the challenge of thinking about what I was going to photograph at that moment and thinking and imagining what it would look like when I made the final prints in my dark room. As I said, two or three days hard work and you would have a net like this, an intersectory net just off the coast, one of several different types of net. The idea was quite simple, really. The uh, salmon would be feeding, getting fat out in the cold waters off Greenland. And then when the time was right, in the early, early months of the year, they would make their way back to Scotland to relocate their native breeding rivers. They would uh, head for the coast and head up the coast north hugging the coastline as, as uh, closely as they could. When they came to this net, their instinct was to head back out to sea. So they would turn right. They would head along the net and into a chamber, a sort of court, which they would swim into through a little gap. But then of course, once they're in there and fully submerged, they couldn't then swim back out. The tide would then go out, the net would be revealed and the fishermen would go out and retrieve the fish, and that would be how they harvested it. This picture refers back to the first one I showed you of the men, and it was taken a couple of years later. And by that time already, the number of men working in what was a seasonal job had started to decline. Some familiar faces, but unfortunately, there wasn't enough work to go around. 
and where once huge companies had run massive fishing operations all across Scotland. By the time I got to photograph them, well, there was only a few men, each of whom had a license. They employed a few more men as hands during the summer, but really the whole thing was in decline. The reasons for that, we'll maybe come on to that later. The drama of it, the intensity of it, the, the colour of it, even in black and white, was something that I was attracted to. Not only was it beautiful to look at, it was interesting to photograph. And this is one of the stake nets. This is one of the first ones that I photographed. A really amazing construction. And if you can imagine a beach maybe three or four miles long with something like between nine and 12 of these, and you can imagine the number of salmon that were running back to Scotland in the heyday when there were plenty of fish. And you can imagine that it was a very, very profitable industry. As I said, by the time the mid nineties rolled around and I started photographing, we were looking at an industry much in decline, a rapid decline in numbers of fish and the big companies had left the stage and left it to the small guys. I want to also just sort of name check a couple of people. Um, this is a chap called Bob Ritchie, who just actually finished fishing a couple of years ago. Um, I think he was sort of my mentor and my guide in all this. He, was, he worked for one of the big major companies, Johnson's of Montrose, which really was one of the big salmon companies. Historically, photo, um, they, they, were, they employed dozens of people, not only on the beaches, um, fishing the salmon, but also in the back office. Uh, they had a big headquarters in Montrose. Montrose, the town, again, that's about 40 miles north of Dundee, known as Salmonopolis. Uh, an amazing, amazing um, industry, all based around salmon fishing. By the time I met Bob, he'd just been, he was just in his last year at Johnson's. Uh, Johnson's got out of the fishing, I think, in 1987 or, uh, 1997 or 98. And he set up on his own and he became my kind of go-to person. I would always be on the phone to him asking when would be the best time to come up and visit you and see what you're doing and photographing. And he'd tell me the different tides, the times, when he'd be fishing, what the weather was going to look like. He was a kind of source, not only of information, but inspiration as well. This particular picture probably became the best known picture of the entire project. It's titled Hailstones. I simply gave it that as, as a description to kind of mark it out from many of the other pictures that I took. It was, I think, the most dramatic picture I took. It was a May day, May the 30th, in the year 2000. And actually, Bob Ritchie's in the picture. He's the man in the background. His colleague, Jim Mitchell, has just fished the net. And you can see the little gap from which he would dip his net in, take the fish out, and he's returning them to shore where they'd be dispatched and then put in crates. And then, then they would move on to the, the other nets on the beach. The versatility of this type of net had replaced the big long stake net. And it made it viable for two or three men to work the entire beach. So Jim and Bob did that all summer long. I love this picture just because it, every time I look at it, I think of this project. It's one of the pictures that has been um, reproduced most often around the world. Articles have appeared in various uh, books, magazines, publications, journals, this one from Germany. And also this particular image is one of several that resides in collections of the work. Um, the Scottish National Photography Archive has a set of the pictures, as does St Andrews University Library, one of the biggest independent photography collections in the world. It's a great honour to have my work in these collections and it seems to breathe new life into the work as they, they periodically come out for exhibition at various locations. Again, going back to the sort of idea of the rituals, I'm, uh, I'm always struck, although I'm not religious myself, by the kind of religious metaphors that exist within the work. I suppose fishing is something that has something biblical about it. But I always sort of looked for something almost biblical, metaphorical in the work. I don't know if anybody else sees it. But it's certainly something that I've always, has always resonated with me. And um, 
The other thing is the sort of surprise element. Um, this is a sort of image which I look at and I think I wouldn't typically think of this as salmon net fishing. Um, one of the poles has collapsed in a storm and Jim here in his uh, waders and his sou'wester and his oil skins is out righting the pole so they can continue fishing. Because like everything, it's always a race against time when nature's involved. I'd often spend an entire day with the men. Without the pressure of time, I really wanted to dedicate as much space as I could in my life to making this project work. I like this particular image because it sums up the end of the day, a job well done. The two men slightly slouched, tired by their day's exertions, heading off with a bit of equipment, maybe a couple of fish, um, heading off for home and a well-earned rest. It was a gruelling season because you had to fish twice in every 24 hours on the tide. So if the tide was right at 2 a.m., you would be fishing at 2 a.m. And then 12 hours later, you'd be fishing the tide again, and so on and so forth, advancing by one hour per day all the way through the summer. As well as the coastal nets, they did in-river in fishing. I find this quite interesting because it was more labor intensive. You required more men. And this is where I met a lot of young people. And it was very refreshing to see that uh, it wasn't just the kids of fishermen, but local young people would, would work the summers on the rivers. And that was a bit of a tradition in Scotland, as it is across many cultures in the world, where young people and communities would get involved with the fishing. This particular fishing on the River North Esk was still a very productive one and was one of the last ones to be fished in Scotland. I loved the fact that you could go out late at night with these people and you could just luxuriate in the calm and the quiet as the men got on with their work. There wasn't a sound to be had except the nets rippling on the river and the chatter of the men and the boys as they pulled the net up and down the bank encircling the fish in the river and hauling them to the river bank. The other aspect I liked doing was going out on the boat. The fishermen had these large flat bottom cobbled boats. They looked like they were hundreds of years old and they could withstand everything. When the tide was at a certain point, certain parts of the net had to be fished using boats and it was always a thrill to get in the boats. They rocked from side to side sometimes a bit precariously and trying to balance oneself to take photographs was sometimes a feat of gymnastics and engineering all at once. Again, it had a slightly different dimension to it. I loved making portraits of the men in the boats. The men didn't like posing. They weren't posers. They were very discreet men. So I'd have to take my chances where I could and when I could. And so I sort of used a medium format camera, twin lens reflex, so were, I was a bit more incognito. I'd be looking down into my camera and catching the men at moments which I thought indicated a bit about their character. They had such wonderful faces and there was always these quiet moments between the, between the nets when we were going from one net to the, net to the next in the middle of the fishing. You would just get these moments, these thoughtful little pauses and then you'd get a man, a fisherman looking out to sea He's almost looking at the net, anticipating what's going to be in there. Of course, we had no way of telling until we reached the net, whether there'd be no fish or one fish or a dozen fish swimming around. That was, the, that was the amazing thing about it. It was all down to nature. And there were some beautiful fish, big fish. By the time I was starting fo to photograph, the sizes were starting to reduce. The number of fish were going down. And the reasons for that? Well, I said earlier, those are quite contested reasons. There was overfishing. I think there's no doubt about that. But there were other things at play. The, uh, the effects of agriculture, the disturbance of the natural breeding beds from the change in land use, agricultural runoff from pesticides, chemicals, those were big factors that made the rivers less healthy and uh, less attractive and sustainable for the fish to return to breed. Also, rising sea temperatures, the, the cold waters off Greenland, which were the feeding zones for these fish, they were starting to get smaller and smaller. There were other hazards as well. Seals, 
the seal population of Scotland in the last 40 years has risen exponentially from something like 30 or 40,000 in the late 1970s to something approaching 200,000 at the moment. These are predators for salmon and something that the men quite controversially had to deal with. Again, I talked about, about the, the culture and getting the kids and the families involved. And I loved that aspect of it. It was very playful. There was always a moment you felt that you were part of a bigger, more extended family. And the lovely thing about that is it extended right across the, all the coasts of Scotland. Again, by the time I got working with the men in the 1990s, it was really principally just the East Coast and the North Coast that, was still, that still had productive fisheries. The West Coast, well, the fish stocks by then had collapsed. One of the other reasons I didn't touch upon, because I will touch on in a minute, was the fish farms, aquaculture. In the 1970s, there was a very aggressive policy of sighting fish farms on Scotland's west coast. These, were ten these tended, the cages tended to be situated in the tributaries and the mouths of rivers. And it doesn't take a scientist or a genius to work out that these were going to be barriers for fish returning to their breeding rivers. The fact is, right up to the 19, early 1980s, the fish stocks on the west coast of Scotland were really strong. I have friends who are fishermen, who were fishermen on the west coast, and they talk about abundance in the 1970s. But almost overnight, between 1981 and 1984, the stocks collapsed. It cannot be a coincidence that that happened at the same time as the fish farms were being expanded and coming on stream. Fish love clean nets, they don't like dirty nets. So the cleaning and changing of nets was one of the hardest, and most unpleasant tasks that the men had to undertake. Stripping the nets down from the poles, hauling them into the boat, taking them to the, uh, to the netting station to be washed, hung up, dried, and then beaten free of all the weed and jellyfish remains was one of the most punishing parts of the job. It's one of the parts of the job I like photographing the most because you got the most physical effort. That net weighs, well, it's hard to know what that weighs, but it's a stinking net that's probably been in the, um, been in the sea on the tide for a couple of weeks. And by the time it comes out of the water there, you can't even recognize it as a net. So these aspects of it, when one thinks of fishing, one has a slightly romantic aspect to it. One thinks, you know, the, uh, the joys of going out on the, um, in the boats, the, uh, the beautiful scenery, the lovely long beaches, the abundant harvest of salmon. But one, what one doesn't often think about or see is the sheer effort involved. Here's another of my favorite pictures that kind of gives the scale. Scale's everything in, env in the environment, isn't it? When you think about the scale that we are, we're tiny dots on a planet. And there was something very small about the salmon fisherman. He had a big role to play, but in, in comparison to the big ocean, the big beach, and even the big net next to him, he looked small and vulnerable. Here's another picture of one of the drying nets, drying greens with the nets being mended. It was an endless cycle. And again, on a pleasant sunny day, it had a hypnotic feel about it. It was quiet, it was dutiful, it was purposeful, but it was still necessary work and it had to be undertaken regularly. I like looking beyond the men and beyond what they were doing to have a look at uh, odd little quirks. This is, this is a drying green at a lovely place called Fish Town of Uzen. I spent time just on my own, not with the men, but just wandering around. Having a look at the architecture, the architecture of salmon netting was something that was, I was really interested in. The shapes, the texture, not just the sea, but also the nets and the poles. I love the composition, playing around with it, playing with the light. That was a freedom that as a photographer you had. And it was something that fed in, I think, quite pivotally into the wider project. Again, this is a picture I took at the end of the season when everything has been taken in, the ropes have been taken down, the nets have all been taken in for one last wash and mend and, and clean before being stored away for the winter. 
Again, I wanted to sum things up, a quietening down, when everything starts to sort of bed down for the winter. Often the men would work in agriculture during the winter, or they would have uh, be employed on the river to do maintenance to banks to make sure everything was ready for the, for the, for the next season. And finally, just wanted to talk about another of the men who was a great inspiration to me. And then that leads on to sort of wider discussion about what happened, what happened to the men, what happened to their industry. And more importantly, how does that feed into a wider narrative about Scotland, about how we view our land and how we use our land. This is David Puller, one of the first fishermen again that I met. He passed away last year at a ripe old age. And I remember spending countless hours sitting in his kitchen overlooking the North Sea, overlooking his, his salmon netting station, and just talking about the issues of the day, about the challenges they faced. There was a constant challenge from anglers. I would say it wouldn't be understating things to say that the salmon net fishermen at times were at war with the anglers. The anglers had money, they had power, and they had influence. And they also had an aggressive policy of buying up the netting stations. Many fishermen, when confronted with the prospect of declining fish stocks and fish catches, took the money and left the industry. For the anglers, that meant the local rivers were free to fish. But of course, what we found out in the years that, that uh, followed was that the salmon, net, the salmon numbers didn't return. The numbers continued to decline even after the netsmen had been bought out. But David Puller and his family, they were different. They wanted to continue fishing. It may not have been the most profitable thing they'd ever done, but it was in their blood and they wanted to carry on. So they fought, they fought the government and indeed they took a, a high court, uh, they took a court action out against the Scottish government to try and reinstate salmon net fishing only last year or the year before. Unfortunately, they lost that. So I think we're talking about the end now. Will it come back as an industry? Highly unlikely. There are parts of the world that still use interceptory nets. Alaska is one place I think that still has interceptory nets to catch wild salmon, Pacific salmon. But the Atlantic salmon is free to, row, to, free to uh, swim the seas without the encumbrance of structures like this in the sea and on the beaches around Scotland. What we have lost is a way of life. I think that's very sad, but I always knew that things were going to eventually come to an end. It was a trajectory. And for me, it was a race against time. I just wanted to photograph and photograph, not for nostalgia's sake, but just because I always thought this was a very, very touchstone issue. How we use land in Scotland is something that's been up for debate now for many years. The current, the current Scottish government has enacted land reform to try to give communities more control over their resources. That tends to be looking at agriculture rather than fisheries. Fisheries is a slightly different thing. Again, because the, the salmon net fishing has, has stopped now, they don't really have a voice in a debate about the future of how land and seas are used and the resources are used in Scotland. But we shouldn't, we shouldn't forget them. We shouldn't forget the contribution they made and we shouldn't forget that the countless communities were sustained by salmon net fishing over a long period of time. Hundreds of years in many cases. That's the final photograph I wanted to um, show you. This is, uh, this is just a little bit of housekeeping from me. I would like to open uh, everything up to a bit of a discussion. Um, where it's gone for me now is quite interesting. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so you can see me again. One moment. Stop share. I'm back. Um, I'm hoping to take, I, I, I suppose, write, writing, photographing a final chapter of this particular story for me. Um, I'm hoping to work with a, an author, Adam Weymouth, who I think might be in the audience tonight. What we're going to do is revisit the people and the sites that I visited over a period of 15 to 20 years. And again, it's not going to be a nostalgic thing because I'm interested in now, in now in the um, historical lineage of the salmon. 
of the culture of the salmon. Because now what we have is factory produced salmon on an industrial scale in Scotland. And it's something, it's an industry that's set to grow and grow, probably not quite exponentially, but the Scottish government is very wedded to aquaculture and fish farms. It's a very controversial subject, and there are a lot of people looking into the environmental impact of pollutions uh, in the seas, and also just the sustainability, the way that the fish is produced. So I'm, but I'm quite interested in the culture as well, because ultimately they're still salmon and people are working in a salmon industry. They're not using artisan methods to go and uh, catch salmon using nets, the way that their fathers, their grandfathers and their great grandfathers had used, but they are nevertheless involved with salmon and if you like food production. And it'd be interesting for me to see, I think two sides of it. One looking backwards, talking to the men, talking to the salmon net fishermen, looking at the legacy of their industry, but also looking forward and seeing what aquaculture and fish farms and large scale industrial production of food means not only for the seas and the land around it, but for the communities. Because there are many communities that for better or for worse, depend on the jobs that fish farming brings. Scotland's coastal communities have changed a lot. They used to be rich and vibrant places with uh, abundant work opportunities. It was hard, it was manual, and it was seasonal often. Those opportunities are now largely gone. What we're left with is something more mechanized. Is that a good thing? We don't know. Long term, we need to start thinking about the consequences. The way people are living in Scotland is changing. The way we're using, using the land and the seas is changing. Where there used to be artisan small scale fisheries, now there's large scale industry. Again, it's a debate, a debate that is political, but should involve everybody in the country. I hope it's a debate that people in Scotland engage with. And I hope that my work, my photography in some way can be a starting point or a trigger for people to debate what they're seeing, think about the past, think about the present. And I think more importantly, think about the future. Thanks very much. Colin, thank you so much. That was an incredible presentation. Your pictures are stunning. And the, the story is it's so critical. And uh, especially now with what we're looking at with climate change and, and our environment. So I have the feeling there are probably a lot of questions. Um, so if you'd like to write them in the chat and direct them to me, Kathy McCarran, and we can see what people have to ask. Um, and while we're waiting for the first question, it, I, I'm just curious um, whether or not you you sort of knew what you were trying to depict or did you let the story emerge as you were following these men around? Oh, it very much emerged. Um, I had no idea what I was embarking when I first started photographing. And I think that was the lovely thing about it. I mean, I, I tended, as I said, just to work on very sort of single issue, short stories, if you like. And this was, this was, to, to stretch the metaphor, this was the novel. This wasn't a short story. So I was just, I was just led by the subject. I, I just gave myself over to it. I experimented with different cameras. You might have noticed there's different formats there. I never wanted to stick to one particular thing. I wanted just to always kind of reinvent it, just endlessly curious about it. And it, it, was, it was a difficult thing because the men are very quiet, private and taciturn. So to try and get information about who else was fishing and where they were fishing, there was no written records that I could find. It was all word of mouth. So I was kind of led by the nose and led by the men at the same time. So I, we don't have any other questions yet. Does anybody else have a question? Oh, here we go. All right. Here is from Craig Easton. And it says, with the proliferation of smartphones and cameras, there's a common assumption that, quote, everyone is a photographer now. What do you think that means for the documentary record? The kind of work that you spent a whole career researching, thinking about, sorry, and, and photographing. Work, as you say, that is held in important collections and available for reference by future generations. Are you worried for the future? Sorry, are you worried for the, where, where am I? 
uh, for the future of documentary. Will people still have the dedication that you've shown to ensure we have an in-depth and knowledgeable record of who we are as a society? Or will we be relying on Instagram and would that be a problem? And don't wow. ask me to repeat that. <laughs> wow, yes, uh, the, the, the subject of my next thesis. Uh, thank you, Craig. As always, a very thought-provoking question. Um, yeah, I think, that, I think the thing to think about now is not so much about the photographer, because I think there are still photographers out there producing fantastic documentary work, but it's, um, it's the platforms where we have to show them that I think are more under threat than the actual work themselves. Um, I see a lessening commitment to the sort of work that documentary photographers do. Um, there are fewer and fewer outlets to publish the work unless you self-publish, which I do a bit of. Um, and I think there's much more focus now in photography on collaboration. And what I mean by that is literally collaboration between the subject and the photographer, whereby the photographer becomes almost part of the narrative, part of the story. And I think traditional documentary photography, if you like, which is, I think, what I have worked on in the past and I continue to do, I think we always accepted that there was this space between us and the subject. Now, that doesn't mean that we were ignorant. And I think, he, uh, I think uh, Craig was uh, quite right in, the, in his summary there that we, what we do is we research, we're interested, we're engaged, but there's still that slight space that the artist has with the subject. And I suppose what I worry about now is that that space is becoming blurred. And that's perfectly legitimate, but I think then it's kind of taking away from many of the skills that the individual documentary photographer has, and we're moving towards a series of images or a, or a way of looking at images which doesn't, which doesn't recognize the individuality of the documentary photographer. Now, whether Instagram will survive, I mean, I like to think that the uh, silver gelatine prints that I made in my dark room 20 years ago and are now sitting in some archive or collection, I would like to think that 250, 300 years from now, somebody will pull them out of a drawer and they'll be as good as the day I made them. Will all that digital stuff still exist? And what will be our attitude to all the digital stuff? Will Instagram exist? We simply don't know. We're at the mercy of, of the future and all that stuff, I think. So Colin, we have some students in the group and we're wondering if you have any advice for people wanting to get into either photography or photojournalism. Oh, my goodness me, that's a, that's a question. Um, um, yes, I have lots of advice. I think you have to increasingly go in with your eyes wide open. Um, it's, it's, it's always been a tough environment to, to operate in. Um, are the opportunities less harder? There are more photographers because there are more people studying photography. There's more people interested in photographer in photography. Um, you know, when I was growing up, we were kind of few and far between. I mean, it's a good thing, the democratic sort of democratic aspect of it. That yes, everybody's got a smartphone. Cameras are much cheaper. It's ubiquitous, and you can do it. But that also brings the, the massive challenge. How are you going to make it sustainable? How are you going to work, make a living as a photographer? So you have to work smarter. And I've discovered that in my career. I don't have the luxury simply of working on lovely long-term black and white documentary photo, uh, photo, uh, photography projects anymore. I simply don't have that. I've got to do other things, a bit of education, a bit of corporate work, a bit of media stuff. Uh, I run some courses, um, I, I print my own books and sell them. So I kind of aggregate making a living from many different, uh, from many different sources. What I would say is if you really want to do it, be passionate about it, care about it, care about the world. Be passionate, go out there, be curious, be endlessly interested in people, 
but also in politics, because politics is everywhere. It informs everything we do. Be, you know, be connected, be switched on with the world. And if you do all those things and you're determined and you have a bit of luck and you find people who are interested in your work, because you'll have to make them interested in your work, then there's no reason why you can't have a, have a long and successful career as a photographer or simply have it as an, a passion. So you may go and work for, I don't know what, in a bank or in a shop or in a car wash. But if you take your camera out the weekend or whenever and you're passionate about it, we'll see that. We'll see the passion in your work. Excellent. Thank you. Now here's a question from Dana Berry. Who regulates salmon fishing? Westminster, Edinburgh or the EU? Um, do, 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 do. It was interesting. They were they were um, it was regulated at a very local level by um, by boards, by fishing, by river fishing fishery boards, and they were made up by the kind of interested parties. So the landowners, the anglers, the salmon net fishermen. Um, and there would usually be some representation, I think, and I could stand to be corrected here, from local authorities. Um, where national government got involved before 1997, when Scotland then had a devolved parliament, it was the UK government at Westminster. Now, where they would get involved is in um, the larger policy areas. So things like... Um, when, when the seasons would start and finish, quotas, broadly speaking, although quotas were a very difficult thing to regulate. So there were, over the years, from I think the 1840s onwards, there were regular commissions of inquiry held by the uh, government in Westminster in London as to the sustainability of, of fishing. And they were kind of mediating if you like, this, this, the disputes between the various interested parties. Um, it was ultimately the Scottish government that decided on scientific advice that they were going to introduce a moratorium. That moratorium initially lasted three years and then was extended a couple of years ago. And I think the, um, I think to be honest, the feeling is that's that's it. There's not going to be a going back on that. Um, they've even stopped the, the sort of scientific aspect. They used to have a used to sort of run in parallel a small sort of scientific study where you used to catch fish, monitor the sizes. I'm not even aware that they use salmon netters to do that anymore. In terms of the EU regulation, I think that didn't really have anything to do with it. That more would have had to do with. Uh, export of live or uh, well not live fish um, export of fish for food consumption um, so that I think slightly roundabout answer is is where the responsibilities lay for uh, for the salmon fishing excellent thank you and here's a question from Scott Anderson and he writes so many parallels with lo local fishing communities on Cape Cod this story shows that the salient issues are global the more stories we can share demonstrates the universal nature of the challenges we face. Can you comment on this and the role of the storyteller in this time when technology allows us to reach further with relative ease? Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I'm not a fisherman, but I would, I would hazard a guess that wherever a fisherman goes in the world, they see something of interest when they see a fellow fisherman. And I certainly know that, I mean, I've been fortunate to travel in a lot of parts of the world and when I see somebody doing something which looks a little bit like salmon net fishing, I mean, I've seen them in the south of India, um, I've seen them in, in parts of, of the Americas, um, and I immediately kind of gravitate towards them and become interested in them. So I suppose as a photographer, if I'm interested, then I think, yes, globally, we are all connected. I mean, the seas are all connected, the issues that affect us number one being obviously climate change, global warming, things like that. And for anybody that does anything to do with the environment, and fishing is clearly to do with the environment, the impact of climate change is, is going to be massive. And that joins us all up. It, and our actions, however small or great, um, do have an impact um, and did have an impact on salmon net fishing. The role of the storyteller, well, I mean, that's kind of my, 
my reason for being a photographer, um, no more, no less. Um, it's, it is about telling stories. It's about creating uh, dynamic narratives that people can, if you like, plug into. Um, I don't think there's one particular singular story about salmon net fishing. I think there's lots of narratives around it. And, and those are the things that I've tried to explore, in a, I suppose, as an artist rather than just as a straight documentary photographer. I'm interested in those narratives. I'm interested in the competing narratives uh, and where they overlap. So the role of the storyteller is absolutely crucial. And I think that is one thing where new technology does offer us enormous potential and possibilities as we can communicate globally using um, whatever platform, whether it is Instagram or, you know, a lot of my work does end up online. You look at my website, it's got a lot of this stuff online. So, you know, the individual photographer and the wider photography community and other creatives, you know, we do now have that ability to reach places where we never did before. I mean, even now, as a result of the pandemic, I'm sitting here in my living room in Liverpool and I'm talking to people all over the world about this. A year ago, I don't think we would have even thought about that. So this, you know, I, I am certainly no Luddite. I love thinking about the work I did, but I love using the technology we have now to, to communicate because that's good storytelling is about communication. Excellent. So we have time for one more question, and this is kind of a fun one. So if a patron called you on the phone out of the blue and offered you a million dollars to pursue any project you wanted, what would you do? Oh, oh gee, there's a good one. A million quid. Wow. Well, I once I picked myself off the floor uh, with a shock because uh, it's, it's, it's increasingly difficult to secure any funding to do anything to do with documentary photography. Um, so if anybody knows of, a, I mean, I'm not, I'd, I'd, I'd even have, I'd sell for less than a million, but, uh, you know, I think I would continue with the story that I outlined earlier, because I'm just about to embark on this next chapter, this final chapter, and I'm really interested in it because I think it, it broadens, it takes the resource that I have in terms of that project catching the tide. And I think it broadens it out and it will, it will ask a lot of questions, but it'll also ask a lot of questions of me as a photographer and an artist, because it will the, the whole landscape has changed. And I'm really interested in seeing what the historical perspectives are on what I did and what the salmon net industry was all about, because we are talking now about historical artifact. We're talking about a project which is 25 years old in the main. And that now gets, it's almost vintage. And sometimes I feel like I'm almost vintage. So I think what I like doing is taking things and renewing them and taking that as my source material. So if anyone's got the million dollars, please step forward and I will happily spend the next few years traversing Scotland because there's still documentary work to be done on the salmon net, uh, netting industry. It's not finished because there was, there was not a lot done on it if you tr troll the internet, there's not a lot out there. So that's why I, you know, I, I value what I did. And I'm very fortunate that other people have valued it as well. So, yep, step forward. Excellent. So thank you so much, Colin. This has been wonderful. And I, I can't even, uh, it's just been such a delight. So I just want to thank everyone for coming today. And I wanted to give you a preview of next week. So the art department chair, Scott Anderson, is going to give a lecture or an interactive workshop called Drawing from Observation. And he assures us that there's no talent or previous drawing experience required, just a pencil, drawing paper, and enthusiasm. So I hope you'll come next week. And I also wanna thank Vana Trudeau and her staff for always running these events so seamlessly. And uh, so my next job will be to try to find that patron for you, Colin, so that you can do your next story. <laughs> so thank you everyone and have a good afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you.